He couldn't believe that the other guy told us everything. Of course he hadn't, but he couldn't communicate with him to determine how I found this out. And of course, in his frustration, he gave me some additional details of what happened, 10 or 15% more. Well, at the end of this conversation, I went to the other guy. And I told him, I just spent the last four and a half hours talking to your buddy, and he doesn't want to go to jail for what he says you did. And I'm pretty convinced that he's got a minor role in this, and you're the main mover and player here. He doesn't want to be uh, you know, held accountable for this. And I told him, I said, I've been, I, he gave me every detail of your crime and everything you've done for the last four days. And of course, I told him now everything that uh, the other guy had said, the little 10 or 15% more, plus everything our surveillance team had, had seen, as though the first guy told me all of it. And because he couldn't communicate with the first guy, I eliminated that communication line. Well, he, he, he ended up giving me more. I only had to go back and forth three times before both of these confessed to every detail of this crime, where the property of the victim was. We recovered all of it. Now, the important part about this story I'm telling you is that you can see now the elements that have to be in place to pull off a successful conspiracy. And I want you to stop for a second now and think about, gee, how, how would this work in terms of the 12? Do we think the 12 disciples had the five things you need? And do we not think that their interrogators, uh, the Romans of the first century, would have interrogated them in a very similar way that I do? Of course, this hasn't changed for thousands of years. And so what we have now is not just two conspiring, but at least 12, at least the 12, of course, more who uh, across the, uh, the, uh, the, the known world at the time sh surely talked about what Jesus, there was, there was lots of witnesses to the ministry of Jesus. And so we have a huge conspiracy if this is the case. That should give you suspicion right away. But number two, they have to hold it for 50 or 60 years. Think about that for a second. Really? Okay, that to me is a bit of a stretch. If it's just 30 years, it's a bit of a stretch. How in the world could you hold such a, a conspiracy for this long, given how many people have to keep the secret? And did they have any pressure applied to them? Was any pressure applied to the 12? Uh, yeah, the kind of pressure that you typically think of like a Jack Bauer on 24. The kind of pressure that whatever it takes, get them to confess. Look, if you wanted to end the Christian narrative, the Christian worldview, the Christian claims in the first century, there's two ways to do that. One, get the body of Jesus and drag it around town. That's going to end it. Or two, get the 12, anyone on the 12, to recant. And what you have missing in any early ancient history related to the Christian worldview is anyone ever recanting. That never, ever happened. Instead, people either went to their death because of their testimony or went to their death without ever recanting their testimony. You don't have, and you have tremendous pressure being applied to the 12. The history of the martyrdoms is, is, pretty, um, is pretty comprehensive. Now, I'm not here to tell you that I believe uh, every traditional uh, account of how the disciples died. But I do know this, there's not a single ancient testimony that any of these guys recanted. And that is one of the quickest ways to end this thing in the first century. So I think what you have here is that the elements you need, the smallest possible number, the shortest possible town, time, great communication. How in the world would Thomas be able in India to communicate with Matthew in Africa or communicate with Paul in Italy to talk about what's being said here, what's happening to you, what do you tell him when they ask this question. You've got no communication, way too many people holding it for way too long a time under way too much pressure and not enough in terms of family relationships. You might have James and John and other brother sets here, but you know, Matthew's related to nobody, has no personal history with anybody, was not a disciple of John the Baptist or a friend of the 12. He was a tax collector. Do you really think, why should I die for what you knuckleheads want us to, to say? Okay, is, anything is possible, and I always say that. But this is not a reasonable, not a reasonable um, um, claim related to the 12, that they were involved in a conspiracy, given what you now know about how conspiracies are broken to begin with. So I want you to keep that in mind, number one, when someone uh, challenges you with this claim that the 12 are just involved in a mass cons uh, conspiracy. But also keep this involved in your mind when someone, uh, as this writer says to me, uh, makes a claim within the Christian uh, church or within your friend, set of friends that some other vast governmental conspiracy involving entire sectors of the federal government to keep an incredible secret together for 30 years. Really? Okay. Especially in a culture right now where all it takes is a book deal or a movie deal and suddenly you're rich. 
I have a hard time believing that such a thing could actually occur. Is it possible? Of course, because anything's possible, but it's not reasonable. And by the way, the standard of proof in jury trials is not beyond a possible doubt. It's beyond a reasonable doubt. What we care about is what is reasonable. Keep that in mind next time someone makes a claim about conspiracy theory. A little bit more right after the break. Be sure to visit the Cold Case Christianity website daily to read Jim's blog, watch the weekly video, or listen to the Cold Case Christianity podcast. You'll also find great free resources, including the free downloadable monthly Bible insert. While you're there, be sure to sign up for Jim's daily case note email. Cold Case Christianity is designed to help you become a better Christian case maker. Okay, let me just add a couple of other um uh, I think important features of this claim that the 12 are conspiring to, uh, to, to basically create a lie, create a, a worldview which is based on lies in order to start a world religion, whatever their thing is. And whatever their thing is, is an important question to ask because it turns out that uh, all lies, every uh, crime that I've ever investigated is driven by a motive. And if you're going to ask the question, why would the 12 lie? Well, then we're looking for the motive for this lie. And you might think, well, gosh, there's a thousand reasons why someone might lie about this. Well, it turns out that really, if you work criminal investigations, you'll discover pretty quickly that there are only three motives behind any crime. Hear me on this. Only three motives. If it's a murder, if it's a theft, if it's a lie, a conspiracy, they're only driven. These things are only driven by three things. Three forms of motive. Now, sometimes I'm pretty emphatic about this. I was just at a speaking engagement. I think it was in West Virginia where I made this claim. And I said, if you think there's a fourth motive for any of these crimes, you're wrong. Sorry. There's only three motives for this. And somebody was kind of offended by the fact that I would be so emphatic that there's not a fourth motive. Well, it's not that I'm trying to, 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 to make an outrageous claim. I simply have not discovered a fourth motive in almost 30 years of working these cases, 26 years. So I think it's really important for us to look at what the motives are for these kinds of crimes. Then we can ask ourselves, if this is a conspiracy, we know it's going to be driven by one of these three motives. And if there is no motive, do you really think then 12 people are crazy enough to do something without a motive? even though it's going to cost them their lives? It's possible, but it's not reasonable. And the three motives we always talk about are almost always the same, and they are. I mean, I've always stated this way. They are always the same, but they're almost always stated in this, this format. Number one, financial greed. Lots of people do stupid things because on the basis of wanting more money or wanting to get money that they, shouldn't, they haven't earned. Number two is sexual or relational lust. Now, sometimes for men, we're really talking about uh, you know, sex issues. You know, they want to, they, they're, they're doing a sex crime or, but sometimes it's about relationships. Sometimes it, it's, they are jealous of somebody. They are, um, they are um, envious of somebody. Uh, somebody is uh, making a, a, a play on their girlfriend or on their wife, that kind of thing. Or and vice versa, it could be a, a woman who's jealous about a relationship involving another woman. Worked a lot of cases like that. Um, the third thing is a little more obscure, and that's the pursuit of power. And sometimes this can be a subset kind of a deal where maybe your authority has been challenged or someone has disrespected you. You'll hear that kind of language a lot in working these cases. Uh, this guy disrespected me. Well, what is the deal there? Well, you're, you're, you feel like your, your pride has been uh, in some way uh, damaged. You, your authority has been challenged. Uh, it's a power issue. You've pursued a certain stature and power in your community. This guy threatens it. So these are the three things that involve uh, that are motivating, are, are, are driving uh, anyone to steal, anyone to lie, anyone to murder. Now, let me just cover one thing before I go any further here. Uh, sometimes people will say, well, wait about, how about these people who are crazy and just, do, just don't have any motive at all for what they're doing? Granted, there are people who are just crazy. And when that's the case, they'll go through a certain process prior to trial in which they will be deemed criminally insane. And we're not going to be able to prosecute those kinds of people. I'm talking about those people who possess a motive, are not crazy, possess a motive that allows us to even try a case to begin with. In those categories, there's only three motives. So if you're going to say, well, maybe the 12 were crazy, all 12 were simultaneously crazy, okay, Possible, but not reasonable. In the end, it's a far more reasonable uh, approach would be to say, well, no, they're all motivated by the same lie, by, to, to, to say the same lie, because they're motivated by the same drive. It's money, it's sex, relationships, or power. So let's take a look at that. Which of these three do we think is motivating the Christian claims? 
Um, do, do you think that the 12 are motivated because they're trying to get rich on this deal? I don't think so. Trying to get a lot of girlfriends on this deal? I don't think so. Well, are they maybe motivated by the fact that they are pursuing power? After all, they became respected within their religious communities, didn't they? Well, let's take a look at the one person who's probably most of the time um, examined, most of the time uh, offered as an example of somebody who might be motivated or might be lying to us. After all, he wrote most of the New Testament. That's the Apostle Paul. Okay, he's, I think, the case textbook case for this. Paul had a position of authority and power and respect as a religious Jew who had been charged with killing the Christians. So you're telling me that he's going to jump out of that position of authority, power, and respect as a religious Jew and jump in with those renegade Christian rebels and, and basically, basically take a beating for 20 years, hoping that someday he can return to a position of power and authority with the subset, the small little minority group called Christians, when he had position, power, and authority with the larger group called Jews? I mean, really? Is that possible? Yeah. Is it reasonable? No. And that's the whole point. So I think this idea that there's some, if they're crea if the 12 are conspiring, then each has to be motivated by something, a payday, sexual lust, relationships, or power. And that's the problem. They didn't even have the power to control the way they died. Remember, there's a big difference between fame and infamy. Lots of people will pursue fame. Few will pursue the very thing that'll get them killed. And that's what we have here. Now, on the flip side of this, when the writer here asks about, well, people in my church believe in the conspiracies related to the Illuminati or 9-11, or you've got to ask yourself a question. There are oftentimes in those kinds of conspiracies where somebody who's initiating the conspiracy or initiating the act is, is going to be motivated by something, right? And if that's the case, you'll eventually it'll surface because five years down, someone's going to give it up. On the other hand, if it hasn't been discovered... Then, then it's, it's, you know, if it has been discovered, I mean, then it's not a successful conspiracy. So again, evaluating motive would even tell us if someone's lying. Conspiracies are another thing. But don't you do the same thing when you talk to your friends or you talk to somebody who's on the phone with you and trying to sell you something? What's in it for him? Should I trust this guy when he's telling me about this product? Not really. He's trying to sell me the product. Okay. I probably have, it's, he's, he's got some benefit if I, if I buy this. So maybe I should be careful about his claims. Is he really telling me the truth? He could be lying to me for the benefit of making the sale. These are the kinds of things we're going to look at when we assess whether or not somebody is, is um, telling us the truth. And I just think as you apply these to the disciples, you apply these to the twelves, you're going to be hard-pressed to be able to argue that they have a motive that's driving them toward this end. So just be careful as you, as you assess these claims. Understand the important thing you need to kind of take away, I hope, from this is the five things that are required for successful conspiracies. That's number one. And number two, the three motives that are behind any lie. Five and three. You keep those details in your mind, you'll be able to respond to anybody who makes an objection based on the statements of the 12 or who wants to offer the possibility of some crazy conspiracy. Hope that helps you and we'll see you right back here next week at Cold Case Christianity. Thanks for joining us at the Cold Case Christianity broadcast. If you're interested in more information about this week's topic, please visit coldcasechristianity.com. For a thorough investigation of the reliability of the New Testament Gospels in the case for Christianity, be sure to purchase Cold Case Christianity, a homicide detective investigates the claims of the Gospels. It's available wherever books are sold.